Hi, this is a lesson about magnets and magnetism. Magnets are something that I'm sure most of us learned about when we were quite a bit younger, and uh, we would have learned that all magnets have a north pole and a south pole, and in a way that's similar to electric charge. We have two types of charge, positive and negative, and then two types of magnetic pole, north and south. And also, like with electric charge, like poles repel, and unlike poles attract. But there is one really important difference between electricity and magnetism, and that is you can't have an isolated north and south pole. A single north pole or a single south pole, which would be called a magnetic monopole, those don't exist. And so you might think, well, what if I broke my magnet? I've got a north pole at the top and a south pole at the bottom. So what would happen if I just break my magnet like that and I have two magnets now, or two pieces and you might think if you did that, then you'd have the south pole at the bottom and the north pole at the top, and you would, but there would be another south pole and another north pole on the two new pieces. So you would end up with two magnets instead of one magnet each with their own north and south pole. And you could keep uh, chopping your magnet up into pieces as many times as you wanted until you got down to a single atom of whatever it was that made the magnet say, maybe it's an iron magnet. So if you had a single atom of iron, you would find that that single atom of iron is magnetic with a north pole and a south pole. Magnetic monopoles do not exist. So there are some ways in which magnetism is like electricity and that there are two different two different types of it, you know, like repel, unlike attract, but there's a big way in which they're not, in which it's not the same. The earth has a magnet inside of it, acts as if it has a magnet inside of it. And in fact, that's why we call the different, the two different poles of a magnet, that's why we call it north and south. The earth has a magnetic field. And we call the north pole of a magnet because if you hang it from a string and dangle it, it points to the north of the earth. And then south pole, the south pole uh, points geographic south. So that's why we call one pole north and one pole south. And it's how compasses work. I mean, that's the whole basis behind a compass. So we've all seen compasses, maybe even used them once in a while. I was in the scouts, so I used compasses sometimes. I had to navigate our way around in the forest to come back and I never did it. I never did it for real where my survival depended on it or anything like that. Okay, so uh, it's actually true. And I mean, if the North Pole of a magnet points to geographic north, well, we now know like poles repel. So evidently the North Pole of a magnet is attracted to geographic north. So evidently geographic north is magnetic south when it comes to the earth and vice versa. Geographic south, magnetic north. So if you if we were to draw the earth, so you know, here's the world, you can think of it, you can the, the earth behaves just like it, it had a, a giant bar magnet inside of it. That bar magnet does not point straight. So here is the geographic north pole. So geographic north at the very top, geographic south. It turns out that the magnetic poles don't align completely with the geographic poles, but they're close. The Earth behaves just like it has a giant magnet in there, giant bar magnet in there, but it's pointed a little bit off center. So, you know, here I guess would be, let's see, put it in red. Here it would be magnetic south, and here would be magnetic north, and this distance from one pole to the other, it's about a thousand miles. I mean, I know it's not, not exact, but it gives you a rough idea what the scale is. But the Earth is really big, so if you're using a compass to navigate, 
unless you are close to one of the poles, then it doesn't matter a whole lot. Depends on exactly where you are, how far your compass needle points off. So it said that there's a line somewhere like between South Carolina and Minnesota, I think there's a line along which your compass will actually point exactly north. The north, the north part of your compass will point exactly north. And then there's another place in Washington State, or if you're there, then your compass points 25 degrees away from north. So you'd get really lost if you went by that and didn't correct for this. Real compass navigators know this, of course, and they know that they have to account for, for your declination, depending on where exactly you are. And navigation maps will have that on them for various places. And if you had a navigation map for Moorhead, then it would say what is the magnetic declination of Moorhead so that professional you know, the navigators that know what they're doing would be able to say, okay, I got to rotate my compass by so many degrees so that I can point directly to that my north really is north. Also, the north and the south pole of the, the magnetic north and south pole of the earth doesn't stay in the same place. It moves. Uh, it's been moving lately, actually, by a measurable amount. And like by lately, I mean in the past few decades. I and mean, on geologic time, that's nothing. But we've we've noticed that it's moving a time, you know, a little bit. It's moved a measurable amount in the last 20 years or so. And by studying geological records, we have been able to determine that actually it flips. Sometimes what is now magnetic north becomes magnetic south. And that seems to, on geologic timescales, that seems to happen really fast. As in, you know, it, it'll stay one way for, you know, a million years, and then all of a sudden, like over 10,000 years or something, it flips, and it'll stay the other way for a million years. So, who knows? Any time, it could flip. And if it did, you know, this, if it did flip now, it would be the first time in modern human history, certainly the first time since we started using compasses for navigation, that, that that has happened. And all of our technology that uses the Earth's magnetic field to work properly would suddenly go crazy. So I think there's even, there's even some kind of a disaster movie if that is the basis, like the Earth's magnetic field flips and things go crazy and you know, like the hero has to survive somehow. I don't remember. I don't remember what the name. Is. I don't remember the name of that movie. Uh, but it has flipped multiple times in the past, and we know that because we can look at the magnetic field. So you know, there are little little pieces of iron and other things in the Earth's crust. So we can look to see. Well. Iron that's been in the Earth's crust for a long time, it's been in, under the influence of Earth's magnetic field for a long time. So when it was laid down and it was hot, it might, it might look like this. And then later, if the field flipped and a different layer of iron was laid down, and when it was hot, the Earth's field was flipped, then it would be aligned completely differently. It would be aligned with the field, Earth's field at that moment in time. So by looking at how, do, how are all the different layers of iron and other magnetic materials, how are they layered, and you can date the rocks using some other method, then you can figure out how has the Earth's field changed over time and it's flipped back and forth. So yeah, you might wake up one day and your compass points south instead of north. Who knows? Oh, and how does the Earth, I mean, where does the Earth's magnetic field come from and how does it flip? We don't know. Obviously, we can't go to the center of the Earth and look. We think that it probably has to do with currents that are in the core. But everything I've ever read about that, whenever I see it mentioned, it always just says something like, we think it's related to currents in the core. And that's it. And it does so if you you know you try to find more about it, you're like, uh, oh, currents in the core. Okay, whatever. And the, the geologists are like, don't ask us any more than that, just currents of the core. Um 
electric current does make a magnetic field. We will talk more about that momentarily. Uh, but you're all, you've all done, I mean, if you think about, you know, back to elementary school or at some point in, in your previous education or even just playing around at home on a snow day or something, we've all made a magnet by hooking a wire, you know, curling a wire around a, uh, a nail and hooking it up to a battery. We've all made an electromagnet that way. So current in a wire makes a magnet. Well, geologists think current in the Earth's core makes the Earth a magnet. They won't say beyond that, or they wouldn't use current. Okay. Well, that's enough on the Earth itself. Let's talk about magnetic fields. I'm sure, that's what everybody's all excited about. And like, well, you told us about electric fields. How about magnetic fields? <laughs> yep. They exist, and we think about them in the same way that we think about electric fields. Is okay, I've got this magnet. So well, let's say I have this bar magnet, and we know if I put another magnet nearby, it would repel or attract, depending on I had a, whether I had a north or south pole pointing toward its north or south pole. And you know, so if I put another magnet, say, here, then my second magnet would be repelled, and if I put it there, it would be repelled instantly and without touching. Just like when I, you know, I, I introduced electric fields the same way. Like, well, if I, what if I had a charge and then I put another charge there? The second charge is repelled instantly. How does it know? You know, how does the first magnet influence the second magnet without touching it? And how does this, I mean, how does it do it instantly? And we now know that it's not instant. It happens at the speed of light. But for the purposes of 202, it's instant. We don't want to get into relativity. Well, we say, well, I guess there must be some field associated with the first magnet that was kind of permeating the space where the second magnet ended up. So that as soon as I put the second magnet there, the second magnet felt the influence of the first one. So in other words, a magnetic field conceptually, is just like an electric field. Magnetic field lines. So I don't know why, but you would think that we would call magnetic field, we'd give it the symbol M, just like we give electric field the symbol E. But no, we give magnetic fields the symbol B. Why B? What does that have to do with magnets? I have no idea, but it's a universal convention. We just deal with it. <laughs> magnetic field or B field. They have lines that are associated with them. And they those they point away from the north poles and toward south poles. Just like electric fields point away from positive and toward negative. Okay, so remember when we had I showed you what the electric field looked like for a dipole, for an electric dipole. If we had, if we had an electric dipole, then the field lines looked like this. We point from positive to negative. The simplest magnetic arrangement is a magnetic dipole, which you know you would just think of as a bar magnet with one north and one south pole. The magnetic field lines look just like that. They point away from north towards south, and also, just like with electric field lines, if you draw the electric field lines for some particular mag arrangement where the field lines are far apart, the magnetic field is weak, and where the field lines are close together, the magnetic field is strong. So you could look at this picture of the magnetic field lines from a bar magnet, and you would conclude that the magnetic field is strongest when you're really close to the North Pole or when you're really close to the South Pole because there's a bunch of lines there per unit length. But out to the side of the, like out to the side, especially in the middle of out to the side, you know, like in here, 
the magnetic field lines are really far apart from each other, relatively speaking. So you would you would think, well, when you're basically halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole, you have a very weak field. And that's what this says, shows. I mean, you know, neither of those things like, okay, well, when you're close to the pole, it's strong. When you're in the middle, it's weak. Well, that makes sense. So what are the units? of magnetic field, Tesla. That's the SI unit. And another metric unit of magnetic field that's used quite a bit is the Gauss. Okay, so one Gauss equals 10 to the minus four Tesla. Okay, so the, uh, the abbreviation for Tesla is a capital T. The abbreviation for Gauss is a capital G. So, to give you some idea of what the strength of that, I mean, how big is a Tesla? How big is a Gauss? Well, uh, the biggest, the most powerful magnet that people have ever made, even in the laboratory, like, you know, scientists making a magnet in the laboratory, under 100, I don't know, just say a, a Tesla, maybe a hundred Tesla, something like that. It's actually hard to make a really, really strong magnet. You know, Tesla is a big unit of magnets. Uh, the NMR machine that we have upstairs on the fourth floor, I think it's two Tesla. I know when I was a, when I was a grad student, my physics department had a, a nine Tesla NMR machine, and that was a really big deal at the time. So Tesla is a big unit. It is about 0.25 Gauss is, is around a quarter of a Gauss. So Earth's field is a pretty weak magnetic field. The strength of Earth's field, it depends on exactly where you are. So, you know, I can't write down a single value. So let's just say it's about 0 0.5 Gauss. And then a really strong magnet, about 10 Tesla. And then, uh, Particle accelerators like CERN, like the big Hadron Collider at the you know, in Switzerland, CERN Switzerland, maybe 30 Tesla. And there you're talking about okay, that's that's huge. Speaking of magnets, you know, if it, if I talk about so you know, where are we going with this? You know, why why you have to study magnets in, in general? What are they good for besides particle accelerators? Well, NMR is one of them, uh, but you know, other than scientific stuff, well, MRI, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. MRI is essentially NMR except on people. And instead of spinning the sample, because if it was a person, it's kind of hard to spin the sample. Instead of spinning the, um, you know, instead of spinning the sample, you spin the magnet. That's, that's what MRI is. It's, it's exactly the same technique as MMR. It's just that when they transferred it to a medical application, the person who was doing it, I guess they had enough marketing skills to know that if they put the word nuclear in the title, then nobody would do it. So they called it something different. But, it, but MRI is basically MMR. It's the same thing. Also, application scientifically would be uh, mass spec. Mass spectroscopy, you have to use magnets in that too. So yeah, chemist, chemistry, you see a lot of, you use a lot of magnets in chemistry lab. Or if you're a doctor, MRIs. How, how do I define or calculate the strength of the magnetic field, or how would I measure it? So to do that, we actually have to use an equation. How we measure magnetic fields is on the effect, or how we define the strength of them and measure them is is by the effect that the magnetic field has on a charged particle. A charged particle that passes through a magnetic field, a moving charged particle that passes through a magnetic field, a moving charged particle that uh, passes through a magnetic field uh, experiences force. Okay, so let's say that it's a charged particle Q. So let me, so it has charge Q and it passes through a magnetic field B and experiences a force F. Okay, and it's passing through the magnetic field at an angle. 
Okay, so experience is a force. Now I'll write the force out. So here I will, F equals Q times V. So it's, it's traveling uh, through the magnetic field B with speed V. Okay, so F equals Q times V times B times sine of theta, where theta is the angle between the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field. Okay, the direction of the force, so the direction is always perpendicular to both the uh, velocity and the field. We'll talk about direction next time. Uh, and well, actually, so we'll, we'll leave the, we'll talk about, we'll do some examples with that equation next time too. Okay, so I have a question from the chat. Would it be correct to say that every atom in the magnet has a north and south, or is there just one north and south pole per magnet? Well, that's a good question. So I would say that every atom in the magnet has a north pole and a south pole, and the thing as a whole. So you you may you may know of bar magnets that quote lose their magnetism. You know, like the bar magnet is kind of dead. That happens when the individual atoms in the bar magnet, their north poles and their south poles don't line up. They're not all lined up. Let me let me draw it. Physicists represent the these little magnets. We, we draw we represent the north pole and the south pole by drawing an arrow. So the pointy part of the arrow goes with north and the bottom part south. In a bar magnet that's working really well, that's that's good, you know, it's got, you know, the strong magnet, all the atoms will have their north poles lined up with each other like that. And then if a lot of time goes by, or maybe you heat it up, or you get it next, you, you put it, you know, next to another strong magnet, and you kind of scramble, you know, you put the strong magnet in various places around it, and just kind of scramble those up, then you end up with something that would look more like this okay so they're they're not it is random the left bar magnet we would say is magnetized and the right bar magnet is not magnetized but in both cases the individual atoms inside the magnet they all have a north pole and a south pole and not all atoms can you do that with i mean it's not like you can if you have a piece of wood you're not ever going to get it to look like the bar magnet on the left if you if you have a a bar of wood, it will never look like the one on the left. It'll always, I mean, because because even those individual atoms don't have north and south poles. Only some of them do. You need an unpaired charge if you're thinking chemistry terms. There are some things like iron where you can have it look like the bar on the left, get a bar of iron, or it could have, it would look like the bar on the right, you have a bar of iron.